say the code, honor to Ukraine, honor to its heroes. Come in, close the door. Any Ruskies or Commies among you? There is one Rusky, Russian, but not Communist here. Haha, <laughs> I don't believe you. Let's test you. Okay. Here's the honey poison for the Ruskies. Oh, so it's poison for the Russians. From this honey moonshine, the Rusky falls down as a fly. So if you will not fall down after drinking it, that means you are our kind of man. Oh yes, you see he is a Ukrainian Rusky. He withstood the test. Please walk in. I would like to ask you to try to create something original because the name of the program is The Culture Shock and each of the participants in this show draws something. And it doesn't matter if you're an artist or not because we all are artists deep in our souls, like children. For you, I selected this material. It's charcoal and it is connected to your art show, which will be visited tomorrow. This show features burning cosmic spheres, and this charcoal is almost a piece of such burning sphere. So we will be talking, and you can just continue to draw. Fine. Honor to Ukraine, honor to its heroes. Are there any Ruskies, commies, or traitors among you? There are no commies, but there is one Russian here. Wow, there is a Russian among you? In that case, I can offer you only a choice of two drinks to choose from. Russian intestines or death marses? For me, death marses. Well, it's intestines for me, I guess. My name is John. I will be your waiter today. So go ahead and try death to Marxism. I guess this name is dear to you, isn't it? Uh, not all is so easy, of course. But you too had your own secret bunker. Thus, it is not at all accidental that we are meeting here. You too had your own conspiracy story. You had a so-called wolf's ticket, enemy of the people political refugee form. Tell us more about it. Well, by education and first profession, I'm a theater director. I finished Shukin's Academy in Moscow, worked in different theaters, but all ended up one day when I was called to appear in the renowned three-letter word organization, KGB where I was told, well, you of course understand, dear Igor Nikolaevich, that you will no longer be a director, ha ha ha, and that you will no longer work in our theaters, ha ha ha. And in my case, it wasn't as bad, since I was supposedly fired according to my own will. And all this is because of culture. For the culture reason, that is what I find truly shocking. You didn't commit any crime. No, I never was a dissident. Back then, it was all about our art, quote-unquote, and not our art, our science, and not our science. So my interests in science and art were not, quote-unquote, ours, so to say. <laughs> And then it was even more interesting. I was left without any job, with a tiny son to take care of. He was only six months old at the time, and no one would accept me for any job position. Once I even applied to work as a guard in the security. Imagine I was big and strong, and they said, yes, of course, come tomorrow. I came tomorrow, and they went on explaining to me that they cannot hire a person with higher university degree for this position. And so I was forced to leave the city of Vilnius and I had to figure out how to survive. I even created a new profession called intellectual prostitute. Oh, yes? And how was it? How did it work? Ten rubles, coffee, and a sandwich as a payment. Each evening I was answering for three hours to any questions, be it philosophy, psychology. At the end of the evening I received an envelope with ten rubles in it, and that's how I supported my family.
What else were you forced to do during those days? Well, later I got lucky, they hired me in the field of sports. So from the field of arts, you went into the field of sports. Yes, they hired me as a trainer, psychologist, and physical therapist. I did massages. Good thing that I knew how to do it all, since in my youth I too was in sports. And so I worked. This was already in Kiev. This was your wolf's ticket, so to say, yes. Were they watching you? Well, what do you mean? At that time, so many people everywhere were watching each other and reporting to KGB, so there was really no need to do it specially. <laughs> well, now it all seems to us as the fable. While you truly lived it, you were the hero of it all, so to us such details are extremely important. What can you remember from those times that was shocking and left a mark on you? You know what? When I was working in Kaluga, there was a health professional theater there. I staged plays, even traveled with them around Soviet Union. And then I staged a play based on Estonian poet and drama writer Rumo called The Cinderella Games. In the play, I used various psychological techniques, taught actors to do it. And after that, they called me to the city's main party office. So there were always yours and ours, yes. So get out while we talk nice, or if you don't like something, we can arrange a meeting for you with a psychiatrist. So they didn't even make a hint, it was open text message, yes. There was a KGB guy among them from the old party generation of Stalinists. He said to me, it's pity that now is not 1937. I would have put you against the wall and shoot you down as a dog. He couldn't get over old habits of putting people to the wall. Of course he couldn't. And so they wanted to put you straight into the psychiatric asylum. Yep. And so I left the city and went to Moscow. There I still had good contacts in the theater field. So I met with this woman from the theater and I'm telling her about all this story. She calms me down, tells me that we will get the attention of the media and so on, and then I tell her that they told me that they can arrange a consultation with the psychiatrist for me. And at that first time in my life, did I see a face of a grown-up woman turn white as paper, because all whom party didn't want were sent to the Kaluga Regional Psychiatric Asylum, and she knew it. They were treated there, so to say, so that even when you were not ill, they will make you ill, and you'll come out a cripple. Yes, it was easy. See, back then, for culture alone, they placed people in the psychiatric asylum, not criticized or something. And she said, go back fast and write a statement that you are leaving the theater and sign it with yesterday's date. Oh, I have an honorable drink of Marx. Oh, look how the intestines of Russians look. I never saw them before. I'll risk it. <laughs> so what are we drinking for? How does that Kozak toast go? Let us be, hey, let us be, and respect thyself because we're worth it. Okay, let's be gay or hey, but not become gay. <laughs> I don't know how they differ in taste from the intestines of non-Russians, but I must say it's not bad at all. I recommend it. So is there a connection between them wanting to place you in the psychiatric asylum and you getting interested in psychology and working in this field? No, it was much earlier. I became interested in psychology when I was 14, and by the age of 16, I have created a list of what a director should know in terms of psychology and philosophy. And finally, at 40, I more or less realized it. And also, I studied with a great teacher in the Near East, and all that helped me to develop. The first generation KGB were the old guys, and everything was very rough and primitive, a lot of 
cursing, <laughs> the strategy of fear, and then the new generation came, young, educated, well-read specialists. Talking with them was very interesting indeed. Two times a year I was called to the KGB office for the so-called prophylactic talk. What did they ask during such talks? They tried to make you a KGB servant, offered to help them, or asked me if my point of view changed since. How you have to answer? Well, simply no. So you could answer no, of course. They worked according to the principle. We can't help you, but we can let you be. And because they were truly interested in what I was doing, because I was studying inner resources of a human being, and he used ancient texts and sciences to develop it and paraphrase it in a modern language. Thus, the study was also extremely interesting to them as well. Which moments, most bright and shocking moments, you can remember from those days? I'll tell you a shocking one. My mother came home all stressed out, although she was a tough woman and already used to a lot. She turned on the water in the bathroom, just like in the movies, so that the conversation would not be heard. She tells me that she met on the street, supposedly by accident, an old friend of my father's who's already in KGB. He was old already and my father was already dead. And he said, Tonya, tell Igor immediately to leave the town. We don't have anything serious against him, but someone has organized the negative letters from the workers. We already have received over a hundred of them. We will have to arrest him. So people were writing letters against you to Kijibi? Yes, yes. There were always friends with the hatchet out there. Oh, yes, indeed. And the next day I got on the train and went to the Moscow. I went to Shukin Academy to meet with my favorite professor. In any case, in one week time I was in town of Ribbons, staging a play by Ostrowski titled, For Every Wise Man There Is Always Just Enough Simplicity in the World. How ironic. Such a strange coincidence. Later on, my mother was in the trolley and some woman came up to her and said, So what? Your son finally had enough? He's in prison now? The mother answered her calmly, Yes, he's in prison. I'm bringing a parcel for him. Tell me, how did you come to writing? How did you begin to write? Because you began as a director. You see, I already did it secretly, in hiding. Well, we are sitting in a secret place, in hiding, so I think you can talk about it. Came a certain time, it was in Vilnius, after I read two lectures in the society called Knowledge. The lectures were called In Solitude with the World. In fact, the beginning of the first lecture was incredible. The lecture began with the live broadcast of the Voice of America radio. In panic, certain people began to move around in the auditorium. It came out that they were listening to this illegal radio wave as lecture began. And when they turned on all the mics and sound, the broadcast was heard by all. So the Voice of America became your first lecture. Yes, it was a symbolic breakthrough, I guess. It was a prelude to my lecture. Then some people came up to me who were trying to figure out the best way for us all to immigrate to India, using all this as an excuse, offering to stay there and later go from there to Jimalaya. I began to work with them, all the while perfectly understanding that all this is being taped and listened to by KGB. There were a lot of funny episodes. For example, we had a seminar by the lake, and the people who came to the seminar didn't even know how to fish. Anyway, it all was funny. In the evening, I began each talk as if talking not so much to the people that were there, but rather to the KGB tape recorders in the audience, saying, guys, get ready, turn on your tapes, I start.
But all this was already towards the end of it all, to the, towards the end of the Soviet system. But then in the 80s, it all became very serious once more. It was a new wave of the KGB cleansing. At that time, to people who were leading groups or meetings, KGB placed drugs and guns and arms in their bags and dressing rooms. It was at this time that I legally registered my relationship with the wife I had then. She was also the mother of my youngest son and took on her surname, Kalinauskas, since I was in Nikolaev before, because my mother-in-law said that her grandson can be only Lithuanian and with a Lithuanian surname, otherwise she didn't even wish to see him. What a patriotism. Guys took notice, even Russian changed his last name to Lithuanian one turning from Nikolaev to Kalinauskas. Oh yes, even KGB came to the registration of my name. I really like the story which I read once. It stated that in Japan, the writer did so three times in a row, starting from zero each time, and achieving fame three times. He was considered a success. I really like this idea. I would have changed my last name one more time, for the third time, but there is such a bureaucracy involved with all the paperwork. Well, you see, you already had a Russian name, then Lithuanian name, so now you must have a Ukrainian or a Greek one, just to finish it up. I had an idea of taking Silen as my third surname, since it was my mother's maiden name. But you already use several names. As a writer, you are Kalinauskas, as a director, you are Nikolaev, as a singer, you are Silen, and as an artist, you are Ink. Here, where we are located now, there are many photos around and a lot of them are female soldiers from the Liberation War. I would like to know how you would feel if women would be allowed to serve, for example, in Ukrainian army as soldiers. Well, I think if they would serve as contra-based army, that would be good, since there are a lot of women who would want to apply themselves in this field. Well, I think that women can be even more fierce than men, especially on hormonal level. Yes, look at Chechen war. Women snipers were the best by far. There are many women working in the special forces. I served in the army in the Far East, in aviation, and there were women too. I always found it very interesting, since in order to be in charge of the women, a man must be a very fine psychologist. Well, since you were a soldier, and I too, as an old soldier, would like to offer you a special treat to shoot down your communist past, which made you suffer so. I agree, although the battle with the past is the most useless of all. Yes, but this is purely for the soul, purely symbolical, and here we can truly do it. Ah, then it's interesting. Let's go. Honor to Ukraine, honor to his heroes. Let's see if you are not Ruskies. Hold on, be strong. I'm holding on. You are a Lithuanian son of a Russian nation. Let's see if you have any Russian dumplings, pilmeni, hidden anywhere. Did you by any chance hide them anywhere? Because we do not have pilmeni. They are illegal here. We have only Valeniki, Ukrainian dumplings with meat. Please walk into the isolation chamber. We have fresh hay there today. Hold on, stay strong. Instead of pillow, there is hay. How are you there? Great. You say great, maybe you will not leave at all. You'll stay there. Did you ever sit on the Huba, the army insulation chamber? Me? No. I said, I know how it is. Okay, now you have to cure somehow my spiritual trauma. You can recite a Ukrainian poem or sing a song, anything except Chervona Ruta, because even monkeys in Africa know it by heart. Come on, cut the talk. I feel that you are getting away from the topic and try to trick me into letting you out for free. Wait, wait, maybe some kind of poem. Wait, I got it. Let us be, hey, let us be, hey.
respect thyself because we're worth it. You see, you put them in the chamber as Russians and they come out of the chamber as Ukrainians. Tell me, can we choose in whom to shoot? Yes. Oh, okay, so we can choose. In Stalin then, only in Stalin. Please put Stalin on, so you see that all the conditions are catered to you. But I will have to change my hat for a military one because I can get shot. It's all serious here. <laughs> Oh gosh, please help me. I hope I'll survive this one and not get shot in the process. You already shot his teeth out. Do you feel a bit better? Of course. Great job. You are a guy. You're no Ruski. You're a true Ukrainian now. Let's look at your results. You caused deadly wounds. The victim can no longer live. He's dead. This is for you as a souvenir. Wow. You killed Stalin. I now know how Stalin died. He was killed by Kalinauskas. I congratulate you. It's super. We killed communism. Let's keep on going. <laughs> this is mystical. This mystic theme I will continue tomorrow as well since I'm going to visit the house of Stanislav Lem, a great mystic fantasy writer who lived in Lviv. By the way, I love him very much, and especially his work related to the creation of the psycho-civilization. Unfortunately, it is brief, but it is the theme of psycho-civilization that interests me the most. What would you like me to tell him from you? Tell him that he's great. Okay, so I'll tell him Kalinowska said that you're great. His book played a great role in my development as a person and a professional. Few people know that it was the hairdresser who saved life of a famous writer Stanislav Lem by saving his family from execution or an exile by the Soviets. It was exactly at that time that the Lem family moved to Lviv. In this city, Stanislav Lem went to school, grew up, and then later moved to Poland to attend the university there. It was here that his fantasy stories began, such as Solaris. I don't know, I guess it's worth asking which Solaris is better, the one shot with George Clooney in the lead role or the one shot by Tarkovsky. Let's go and see. Lam lived on the third floor. But will someone open the door for us today? Let's see. Let's try this button, 3A. It opened. Wow, it's mystical. Bulgakov's face awake in comparison by the level of mysticism here. So will little Stanislav, little Stan, open the doors for us? Little Stan climbed these very stairs up and down long before the fantasy stories developed in his head. He was a doctor, studied to be a doctor, and then much later began to write. Shh, quiet, look, this is the spirit of the little stand. Let's go, you'll show me your home. Here you can see the architectural ornaments which Stanislav Lam describes as immortal ones, since they survived all the people, all the times. It is truly interesting that Stanislav Lem left this building and moved to Poland. On his place now arrived immigrants from Germany. Some people leave the city, some people come back to it. I guess it's an eternal tide of time. 
And I must deliver the message from the artist Kalinauskas. He said to tell you that you're a great Stan. The mysticism exists. In this very courtyard, one hung the underwear of little Stan. His mother washed his clothing and placed them on the drying wire to dry. It's a historical courtyard filled with Lviv-style mysticism. Look. So here we are entering this bunker underground, yes. I'm personally curious since I work with films as the art director and artist and you work as the director. So what kind of film you would stage in such bunker-like conditions? You know that I didn't really like gothic films, but you like Stanislav Lem, right? Yes. I would say that I would stage something akin to psycho-civilization like thriller. Long time ago I was a lab rabbit, so to say. I was a certain kind of volunteer destined for experiments. I took part in a number of experiments which dealt with extrasensoric abilities of a human being. It was then that I wrote a script which I called Soviet Rabbits, or Rabbit Soviet style as a certain dish. And what was this script about? It was based on these very materials about people with unusual skills and senses. And it was half drama, half adventure style film with elements of fantasy because at the end of the film, the heroes who defeated the system are sitting somewhere in Tibet and meditating. And this is the great ending to any script. Ciao, come stai? Bene, tu. Brava. <laughs> How are things? Oh, Andrew, it's such a pleasure. All is well, thank you. How great to see you again. How lovely that there is a piano in the center of Lviv, where each can feel as a musician. Remember, and it's important to point out, that you are a person originally from the city of Lviv, and you are a representative in the Vatican, representative of Ukraine and this city. But also, I remember that you are connected to the Vatican chorus. And there were probably some memories from moments which you remember best from your time in the Vatican. When talking about the papal chorus, then it had both the moments of beauty as well as the moments of sadness. When the person I loved and respected the most, John Paul II, by the way, he's especially loved by all the people of Lviv after he sang a song in the region of Sihib near Lviv, a song of sunshine, and the sun came came out and pushed away the clouds. Tell me more about it, because I didn't know about this story. Back then, I never even thought this person would become so dear to me. When I was standing there in Sihib in front of that church of St. Mary's Ascension, by the way, the date is coming up soon of the celebration. And we all gathered there. It was the meeting with the youth. We all were overwhelmed with feeling of anticipation, although we still had not comprehended the whole magnitude of his persona and this event, and even for me at that point, faith was more educational rather than spiritual element, and I was a slow learner. I realized that it was a great persona, and for some reason all were drawn to him. He had that magic in him. A lot of people gathered, basically the whole city of Lviv, and the weather was like today. It was sunny, and then the cloud came, and the rain began, and at that point our Holy Father, by the way soon he will be finally canonized into sainthood, he began to sing a song in Polish. He began calling for the sunshine to appear and push away the clouds with the song. I can't sing it to you now word by word. Wow, 
he was like a religious magician, a true shaman. He showed himself more as the messenger of God on earth, who with his simple magic act has shown that God cares about this gathering, that people of Lviv it was amazing. Tell me, do you remember this song? You know, some time ago I even hummed it, but with time it fades from my memory. I remember that in lyrics it called for the sun to appear and for the clouds hide. I remember that in lyrics it called for the sun to appear and for the clouds to hide, because it must be sunny today. And at that point he even smiled and joked, but all this was so charismatic, I can't even describe you. One must see, live through it. And the second time when I felt something so amazing, something similar, and that is in fact why I was telling you that I felt both joy and sadness, it was when the Pope John Paul II died, and I had a great honor to sing with the papal chorus to be next to his body during the days from his death until his funeral, from the 2nd of April until the 8th of April 2005 present next to his body when the whole world had gathered in Vatican. What did you feel? Was there a magic, unreal energy around? I can only describe that energy by saying that even now, day, when I think of those moments, I get goosebumps all over my body. You know, I would like to invite you to join me for a most expensive in the city of Lviv cup of coffee, because this coffee has no price. Well, it must be the best coffee then if it's the most expensive, or perhaps just so expensive that it has no price. It's a secret coffee, a secret organization which makes this coffee. You see, there's conspiracy all around here. See these stairs? One can break their head here climbing up. All this is very suspicious. These are ancient leaf stone buildings on the Ratusha Square. They all are like that. Good day. A very good day to you. As they say, if your day went well, then the evening must be memorable too. Absolutely. We heard that you have the best and the most expensive coffee here. I don't know about the coffee, but I have this. Oh, this is Lviv coffee. Yes, coffee named Halochka can be only from Lviv. We have tea called conversation. It's from Sihiv, region of Lviv. So on Sihiv they drink only conversation tea? Of course. Where else can can you have a true conversation only on Sihiv. I also have the moonshine from the town of Ternopil. If you drink this, you can skip on going to your farm, because after moonshine, if your cow was lying, it will stand up, and if it was standing, it will immediately lay down. And where from are you? From all parts of the world, some of us from Rome, some from United States. Ah, you came to me from Obama. This is for him. You think he likes this? This is his size? I don't know if it's his size because he's far away and I couldn't measure the size. You need to fly by plane to him. But the most important thing is that he likes it. Please walk into my living room. Okay, so we can come in. Wow, the prices here are ridiculous. A piece of meat costs 2,500. What kind of prices are those? You can choke with it. We have very delicious meat here. Yes, but for such a price, I will choke on it. I won't be able to swallow. You know, we are modest people, especially spiritual people are always modest, so we probably will take the cheapest of the most expensive. Two most expensive coffees, please. <laughs> These are remains of the Masons in Lviv, so that people would remember that they existed. In modernity, only the prices remained from them. Oh, our coffee has arrived. The small one is for me, since I'm small. Look, the most expensive coffee in the world. Look, it's served with spoons of chocolate. Mamma mia, what a great idea. Well, at least once in your lifetime, you got to taste this. Let's taste what Masons used to drink. You know, I remember when you and I were walking around Rome and talking about secret organizations filled with mystery and very few know the inside of it. One place still comes to my mind, the building of Corpus Christi. Can you tell us a little bit about Corpus Christi? What do they do? 
what is their mission in the world? Because there's a lot of talk, but few know the truth. Can you give some examples? Well, it is probably one of the top philanthropic organizations, since they try to help and to develop the third world countries to prevent and stop the hunger to educate. There are many religious orders who work in this philanthropic field. Long time ago, these orders were more militaristic, but now they're purely philanthropic. Among them are such orders as the Order of the Christ of Jerusalem, the Order of Malta Knights. I want to ask you, during your stay and life in Rome, you probably met a lot of really interesting people. For example, you could come to someone's home with your religious mission and you would realize that this person is not ordinary. Yes, first of all, I'm very grateful to life because during my life in Rome, I was able to meet people from all straits of life, from the lowest to the top. Since we were talking with you about John Paul II and his funeral, I was present with a papal chorus in the very heart of it all, at the time when people couldn't even get past the river Tiber. The whole city was filled with people, and I was next to him. I was in the diplomatic corpus with all the leaders of the world who came to give their last honors to the Pope, and it was incredible. When I walked on my way, I saw Prince Charles chatting with Jacques Chirac. I saw all presidents and prime ministers, and even the president of Ukraine was there. I turned my head to look back in realization that I will never see these people again in my life. I was deeply saddened by the event, yet I was so pleased to see that this Pope managed to gather people around him from all over the world, from different religions and points of view. There were Catholics and Muslims, Jews and Orthodox, all standing together as one. And when talking about particular families who became my friends, the home of Eugenio Pacelli, the last Italian pope who was born in Rome, comes to mind. I'm in constant contact with his family. So you are friends? Yes, we often see each other, and every year we gather together to remember Pacelli. In fact, in that building where he lived, lived a lot of noble people, counts, barons, princes. Yes, I remember you were telling me once that you came to someone's home and you realized that this person is a baron. Yes, but if once these people were an untouchable caste of society, now they are just like us, very open, humane, and warm people. In general, when talking of Rome, I can say that it gave me many splendid moments in meetings with such people. And it was stunning to see how these people carried their history and tradition into modernity. Lviv also has its history and tradition, although my first such meetings with such people took place in Rome. It's a great pleasure to see you again. I wanted to take a stroll with you around your city, and as I was waiting for you, I noticed that a Masonic lobby is located right across the street, right opposite of the parliament. It reminded me of the Da Vinci Code. You know the Masonic lobby is the most expensive place in town. The prices there are the highest, but they do give discounts up to 90 percent. I also wanted to ask you, I know that you make a lot of reforms. What kind of other reforms do you plan to do? For for example, in California, they have gay parades now, they legalize prostitution in some parts, also legalize certain drugs. No, we are the Christians, so big no. Okay, so no. There are ten commandments and we stick by them. But when talking about developing social programs in that area, we still have a lot of work to do. Because we are still deeply infected by this virus of communism and because we still have it, we have to push it out of our psyche and our society. And the only way in which we can get rid of it is by constantly working on thyself and bettering thyself. And through you, other people around you will follow your example. Just recently, I came from Amsterdam where I was talking to their mayor. From your words, I gather that you will not legalize drugs in Lviv, right? No, no, no. So the greatest and most potent drug of all is the Lviv coffee. So come to Lviv to get high on it.
So show the people how they should ride on bikes around the city. Give them a mayor's example. Wow, that bike is kind of small. So the people would know how. How did you make him to get on that bike, man? Huh? You like it, huh? Super. I greet you. Here, please meet a true ancestor of great coffee maker Kulczyski. So you will make us a coffee the same way your great ancestor Kulczyski did. Yes, indeed, the same way as Yurko Kulczyski made it once. Darka, please tell us what is the secret of your coffee. In my coffee, I put a touch of salt and a touch of cinnamon. How interesting. And it intensifies the flavor of the coffee. Yes, yes. But I put the salt at the very end. And what is the exact amount of salt which he placed in the coffee? Oh, just very little, few drops. And I know that you are a true coffee lover, isn't that so? So what are your secret recipes for coffee? Well, in reality, the base for everything is a good coffee itself. The question is, when to add the sugar to it, in the beginning of the coffee making process or at its end. I tried also adding cinnamon and even a touch of pepper. It all depends from your personal mood in reality. Well, the person gets used to it fast and time to time you must change it a bit so it stays interesting and new. So coffee is addictive. It's a special form of drug. Actually, I noticed the people in Lviv can drink strong coffee in the evening or even at night. They drink it any time and it doesn't affect them at all. Well, there is a secret to that too. You know that in Lviv it rains a lot and when it's raining the pressure drops and so does the human blood pressure. It drops too. And that is why we drink coffee to keep us feeling good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I greet you in this historical building of the British Club at the show of the artist Igor Kalinauskas. Unfortunately, most of these works are in private collections around the world. So, this basically is the show of one painting. There is one original painting which is framed, the rest are jacquees put on hand and displayed so that the viewer could get a better idea of how the series look together. Once again, returning back to the theme of the location of this show, here you are surrounded by the historic murals, portraits of the king and the queen on the walls, baroque ornaments, yet on the other hand we see absolutely modern conceptual paintings working on a total contrast. It's as if one took the paintings by Malevich and placed them in the Baroque palace. What I'm trying to say is that all this is eternal, the combination of the ancient and the modern, the connection between the two is eternal, and hence is the name of this art project and show, The Sacred. It is an eternal thread that binds the ages. Now a few words about the artist himself, Igor Kalinauskas. He conquered Italy, Milan, on the day of the city of Milan with his show in the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci. Featuring his epic art installation, The Last Supper. 
extremely spiritual philosophical work which was later shown all over the world including Lover Gallery Kia. He had numerous shows worldwide in London such a gallery project in Switzerland all over Eastern and Western Europe. He's the person of the world. And for Lviv, his persona and this project is especially interesting, since Mr. Kalinowska's cradles within him a great mix of cultures, knowledge, talent. He's a writer, artist, psychologist, philosopher, musician. By the way, the music which you are hearing is created by Mr. Kalinowska's and the band Zeker. And it is to this music that the fire dance was performed. Mr. Kalinowskis is a renaissance man, a man of many ways, many directions, all working towards one whole, more or less like Leonardo, so perhaps it's no coincidence that this show took place in the Museum of Leonardo. Now I would like for the artist himself to talk and tell us more about himself and the work. Good evening. It's always hard for the artist to talk since he's used to doing that with his brush. You know, music for me is the other side of painting and painting is the other side of music and both bring a great pleasure to me. And I was also pleased to find out that my work pleases others as well, and people buy it and it crosses lands and oceans and lives a life of its own there. What can I say? My personal prayer, my chant is, cursing the name of Holy Father will be forgiven, cursing the name of the Holy Son will be forgiven, but cursing the name of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven for the rest of times. Amen. In everything that I do, I try to portray how this spirit dwells within the human and can exist in this complicated human world. For me, this is the sense of my art and my life and everything which I do, my writing, my philosophy, my practice and my teaching. I think that the human being is still very far from truly knowing thyself. We know the least about thyself. I always see this image in my head that we are like a midget in front of the giant. The giant is us, what we can be, what we can and should become. And the midget is what we are now in this social order, in this society, what we were taught and trained to do and convinced that this is us, no need to yearn for more. And I believe, and this belief is also based on many, many years of study, knowledge and work with people, that it is very difficult indeed to truly enter thyself. You know, at the end of the 19th century, there was a certain propaganda campaign created under a motto, Path to Thyself, and it was genius. Why it was genius? Well, because it undermines that in order to find thyself, I must seek not in me, but somewhere else, somewhere far, and thus I need guidance on this distant journey and a guide who will lead me there. And a great many were tempted by this idea and went on this journey to the unknown thyself. I'm convinced that the sacred path is the path inside you, within thyself.
суб'єктивності. Дякую. Thank you for the sacred. And talking about the sacred, I have to mention that Mr. Kalinowskis had music performances all over the world in some of the leading cathedrals, including St. Alexander's Roman Catholic Cathedral in Kiev, Cathedral in Paris, Italy, the Slovak Republic, and now are getting ready for the project in Vatican. So now you have this rare opportunity to talk to Mr. Kalinowskis and see the work. Please enjoy it. It truly gives you this feeling of depth, as if you travel within. You know, many times when people go through a near-death experience or coma, they say that they see something similar to this, as if they journey deep within, in a circular tunnel towards the light. Yeah. You know what I envision? That if you look at this circular shape as the laser record path, you can truly hear the music, like a CD record, yes. What is the name of this work? This one, The Depth, and these are called The Wandering Stars. Well, actually, I personally call them the cosmic embryos. In each one of these shapes, there dwells the being of something, the embryo of something, great, be it spirit, love, and so on. But the curator which displayed these first was against the name, and thus I named them the Wandering Stars, according to the book by Shalom Aleichem. The original is very powerful, filled with energy. Yes, the originals are always the best. You know, I want to tell you that Andrew is in the papal course of Vatican. Oh, it's my dream to have a concert there. Well, the style of music is a little different. No, it just seems so. You can't even imagine in how many cathedrals we perform all over the world, including all Baltic cathedrals, and always with permission and blessing of their bishop. And each time the bishop listened to our music, we were granted permission to perform. The spirituality of this music is very potent. There is no cathedral in Vilnius except for the state one where we did not perform in Paris, in Re in St. Peter, in Tallinn, in St. Petersburg, all in the functioning Catholic cathedrals. Yet mostly in Catholic ones, since Orthodox ones are more closed in to the corporation, more traditional, I guess. Once in Tallinn, when we were performing in the cathedral there, American tourists came in. They were already late for their plane. It refused to leave the concert. So much they liked it. You know, it's basically a spiritual polyphony. There is no language, no words. You praise the greater power, the God, with your voice alone. You know, yesterday Andrew was telling me that some of the greatest moments of his life were those where he was near the Pope and in his chorus, since music is an international language. I fully understand him. We too sang all over the world, and no matter where we would perform, someone 
someone would come up to us after the concert and say, you sing just like my aunt used to sing in Aziz Tunis, or you sing just like we sing in the mountains, or you sing just like our village. So it's truly international. Once we had a concert in Moscow for the diplomatic corpus and all the diplomats from all over the world <laughs> found something of their own ethnic tradition in our voices. You can't find these archaic vocal elements in all music traditions, be it Orthodox, Muslim, Hebrew, or Catholics, such as a Gregorian chant. Yes, in Catholic tradition, we use more of a Gregorian chant, and it's different a bit in its nature. So I think our cooperation shall continue, and we will look forward to our next meeting in Rome. We shall see. And what city can it be? What do you think? Paris. Yes, it must be Paris. Why do you think so? There is a baguette, there is Coco Chanel, croissant, red mill, the Eiffel Tower, and there is even my friend Zuzi, the dog, with baguette and a bottle of wine. Even the French cheese is there, Picasso, Van Gogh, Modigliani, and the famous kiss, of course. So our next meeting is in Paris, and for sure, it will culturally shock you.